The human mind is like a computer. No matter how efficient it may be, its reliability is only as great as the information fed into it. That's a campaign promise. Tell us the truth. Tell us the truth. We mandate that the truth be told. You're hearing it. TNT. Welcome back. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're still in hour number one of this live broadcast. I'm your host, Patrick Kenningson. We're live and direct for the next two hours here on TNT, today's news talk. Very pleased that you could rejoin us. We're going to do a hard pivot right now back to the Middle East. We're going to welcome on to the program veteran journalist Leila Hatoum. She's on the ground in Beirut, Lebanon. She's been following and covering events very closely since the beginning of this latest wave of hostilities, which began on October 7th. We don't need to rehash everything that's happened since then, but focus on what's happening now and what's likely to happen uh, in the coming weeks and months. Let's welcome her onto the stage right now. Leila, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me and good evening from Beirut. Good evening to you too. Uh, it's been a, been a while since we've last spoken uh, on air, Leila. A lot has happened. Uh, I think the last conversation we had, you were in Jordan uh, with the airdrop uh, for Gaza campaign. Now, what's uh, transpired over the last week is very disturbing, to say the least. And I really want to start this conversation uh, with what is happening, what is building up uh, in southern Gaza at the Rafa border crossing. Um, if you can give us your assessment of this situation, we're very concerned about this, as everybody is, that this could be just really something that pushes the whole thing right over the edge. Um, but uh, go ahead, Layla. Uh, yeah, it has been uh, a long while, so lots of have, has happened over the past uh, two to three weeks, and you do have to understand that any shift uh, in events can change the whole narrative. Um, three weeks ago, we were expecting an expansion of war. Um, the Israelis were uh, trying to bombard uh, around uh, Gaza City and in the peripheries. They did not go full throttle against uh, the Gazans in Rafah. Um, tens and hundreds have been uh, killed almost on a weekly basis. Uh, the thing is that had the Israelis wanted to do a full throttle attack, they would have done it directly instead of giving two weeks notice. So that made us think like what's happening on the side. And then we noticed there were there were negotiations happening in Cairo and those negotiations were concluded. There was a time of uh, if you if you have noticed calm uh, kind of uh, reaction from uh, either the Israeli side or the axis of resistance across. And um, today we had uh, the meetings uh, between the negotiators in Paris. We had uh, the head of Mossad, David Barnier, going to Paris to start the, to resume the negotiations. And then you had uh, negotiators on behalf of Hamas also negotiating on the release of detainees. However, what we understood from those meetings um, is that uh, there will be no naming of the uh, or, or names or numbers of the detainees that will be released from uh, from the Israeli side uh, in exchange of Hamas's uh, detainees. What they need to agree on at the moment is an action plan for the release of the detainees. And this, as, as they said, basically, as according to sources, it could take uh, uh, days or uh, even up to two weeks. Now, why do they stick to the two weeks thing? It's because Ramadan is in two weeks and a half from now. Ramadan is a holy month for the Muslims. And I had told everybody over the past week, keep your eye on Jerusalem this week. Anything that happens in Jerusalem today during the Friday prayers, you will understand that the Israelis mean escalation or not. The Israelis kept it short. They did not do harassments as they usually do during Friday prayers. Uh, they continued to ban um, young uh, Palestinians from reaching Al-Aqsa Mosque to pray over there. Uh, remember that the Israelis had issued their own decree that no Palestinian above the age, under the age of 50 should be allowed to go into Al-Aqsa Mosque as of Ramadan. This is a big no-no for Palestinians because uh, Al-Aqsa Aqsa Mosque is very holy to them. So we expected some riots to happen. However, things were mitigated, which tells me one thing. Everybody's calming the game at the moment to see the result of the negotiations. The Americans are supporting this kind of negotiation for a reason. The Americans did not bank on the Yemenis to last, the Iraqis to go in and kill eight American soldiers, and the Lebanese resistance to last as long as Hamas is lasting also in Gaza. Depletion war without taking part in expanding the war. And this hurts them more than it hurts them when they have an open war where they can go and bombard as they please. So um, they're pushing for those negotiations. And we'll, we're going, I think we're going to see a tit for tat for the next two weeks unless something changes in the narrative so far. So I, I don't expect an escalation this week, at least this week. We have to wait till next week. Keep an eye on Jerusalem every Friday because during Friday prayers, it will make it or break it. 
for 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 this uh, kind of um, uh, negotiations and the change in narrative. However, I have to remind you of one thing when it comes to Rafah. Uh, we've all heard what uh, the former, uh, basically the former army general and uh, minister uh, Benny Gantz said. He said we're going to continue to fight and we're going to go into deep into enemy territories. We're going to attack Rafah. These are void threats that usually army generals do during negotiations time to push the negotiations towards what they want. So it's all void talk until basically we see the result of negotiations. Sure, sure. And also, it just also gives you an indication. There's people that are talking about Benny Gantz as if he's some sort of dovish alternative to Bibi Netanyahu, but he is as hardcore uh, a Zionist uh, as there is in Israel. Uh, so I think we can put that talk to rest right now. What's really concerning here, and I want to get your opinion on this as well, um, e Egypt building these sort of structures uh, in this area. I don't know if you've had a look at that. Um, that A lot of people will look at that and say, well, um, is Egypt doing this as a contingency plan or is the United States, Egypt and Israel making some, uh, let's say, uh, behind the scenes uh, negotiations or is there collusion behind the scenes in other words do all of these parties know something that's going to happen that we haven't been told yet what are your thoughts on this uh, i highly doubt that all the parties know what's going to happen later on or what's happening at the moment each one has a piece of the puzzle um, the ones who are waging this war or pushed for that war are the americans so they have the most pieces of the puzzle the israelis come next and then basically the arab world comes last uh, as usual when it comes to wars over here which is really sad but when it comes to the uh, cement wall structures that have been constructed by the uh, Egyptians along the uh, Rafah side, from their side uh, of the Rafah border crossing and along that wall, you have to understand if you look at it from the satellite, this area does not fit enough Palestinians. It's like only tens of thousands. You have over 1.3 million people living in Rafah at the moment and South Gaza. You have 2.4 million Palestinians living in all of Gaza Strip. So if the rumors are correct, they would have been building something basically in a different sh uh, shape and larger scale to accommodate at least half of that size, which is not happening. What the Egyptians are actually doing, they're building a, a lengthy wall. I think it's fortifying their, uh, uh, what you call first lines of defense. They're anticipating possibility of war. And if you look at it from a military side, it's always best to have two lines of defense before you actually engage in war. That deters the enemy from going in. They can only go by sky. And Egypt does have the air force and the, the def air defense systems to actually fight that until basically their army engages. That's the first thing. The second thing is that don't forget that uh, the border, the Rafah border crossing from the Egyptian side was bombarded three times by the Israelis. They had to fix the cement walls over there. And there's a small square, sh square shape of about four kilometers by four, four kilometers uh, in, uh, in size. And that was basically to cater for uh, the 10 cities. Uh, there are militaries in the area, NGOs, including IFRC, uh, I, I, IRC and the, uh, the International Federation for the Red Cross, IFRC. So these people need an area to operate from if anything happens. Um, uh, at, at the same time, I have to mention this, and this is very, very critical. As a reporter, we received information from somebody from Jordan the same day the story about the Egyptian constructions being done on the ground that was launched by the Sinai uh, organization that's based in the UK, by the way. And uh, that uh, source in Jordan claimed the same story about what Egypt is doing, but in Jordan. And we asked him to send the videos and photos that he claimed that he had. And he said, no, 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 I will only send it to a Palestinian or Jordanian reporter. We gave him, we provided him with a number for a Jordanian reporter. And we haven't received anything as of now. And that's basically a week and a half ago, which is really crazy because somebody is trying to hype that narrative to create the fear factor, to push towards those negotiations. When you create the fear factor that Rafah is going to be bombarded, people are going to face exodus or a second Nakba, that pushes, that creates pressure on the negotiators themselves, even from the Hamas side. That's interesting that you bring in these details because it, do, it does look like Israel, at least on the U.S. Israeli side, they're really building up a lot of pressure to get leverage for these negotiations. So uh, the, the statements by Benny Gantz, what you're just describing here, it does sound like that's exactly what's happening. So we should be very cautious uh, not to run away uh, with assumptions uh, when we see reports like this. And we appreciate your analysis on that. Um, I just want to one last thing on, on Rob. Rafa, Leila, um, if Israel does uh, come good with its threats to attack Rafa on Ramadan, 
what will the result of that be? Because uh, one, obviously, you talked about the potential for a clash at the Al-Aqsa Mosque, how that would inflame the Muslim world, uh, the Middle East, the Arab world, uh, but attacking uh, Palestinians in Rafah, unarmed Palestinians during Ramadan, what sort of reaction could we expect if this happens? You have to understand, uh, when I'm explaining details and situations, I'm not giving justification to any side. War is possibly going to escalate going forward. I actually believe that there's going to be an escalation unless there's a change in the narrative when it comes to negotiations. Because remember, the axis of resistance, they said from the beginning, the whole thing that we're doing at the moment is to reach a possible solution that the Palestinians will, will be okay with it. And if the Palestinians are okay with that solution, that's fine. But when it comes to, to Rafah, any attack on Rafah, with 1.3 million people over there, at the scale that Benny Gantz is talking about, going deep into enemy territories, wiping them out, doesn't matter what happens, that means a change of behavior on the battlef in the battlefield in Gaza, and that basically could push the axis of resistance to engage in a fully uh, expanded war. And what, uh, what happens in uh, Jerusalem, that's a whole different scenario. If any escalation on the ground could lead to a third intifada. Remember, for the past... Uh, since 2015, we've been riding on the wave of a third intifada. Things have been building up since 2015 until now. So any escalation in Jerusalem could lead to a third intifada. You cannot contain it anymore, especially that you also have other cities across the West occupied West Bank, uh, occupied Palestinian territories. Jenin, major, major, major fights are happening on daily basis since October 8 until today. Tol Kerem, Ramallah, and other cities as well are fighting, but there's media blackout. So I do expect either a possibility of an intifada if there's an escalation in Jerusalem or uh, if the Israelis attack Rafah, there will be an expanded war in the region. However, I'm still banking on the result of the negotiations that are happening. Uh, fingers crossed. They're saying two weeks. That means we have two weeks of tit, uh, tit for tat and trenches war. That's it. And then the other front, obviously, that would uh, be active, may, may, might be activated is, of course, the one that's uh, very close to you, uh, which is South Lebanon. Um, so there's been very disturbing escalations there. Uh, there's a lot of accusations about, uh, you know, American involvement in the Israeli military operation uh, as well. And uh, hitting targets and civilians in South Lebanon, what has transpired over the last two weeks? If you can give us an update uh, and tell us what you think the, the sort of situation report is uh, there in South Lebanon right now. It's very much tied to what we're seeing uh, uh, unfolding in Gaza, of course. But uh, go ahead, uh, Leila. No, no. Yes, definitely. You have to understand the southern Lebanese front, which is northern uh, occupied Palestine front, that's the hottest zone at the moment that hasn't fully expanded. There is war happening. The Israelis have lost dozens of soldiers between killed and or injured over the past two weeks alone. The Israelis had uh, increased their attacks against Lebanese civilians. The total number of Lebanese uh, civilians that have been killed by the Israelis so far has exceeded 42 until now. And uh, at the same time, um, Hezbollah has retaliated and the Secretary General of Hezbollah, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah, he vowed in one of his re most recent speeches that this time it will be blood for blood the Israelis will be paying for the blood that they spilled by their own blood. And that caused a stir among the Israelis, especially those who remember 1996 war against Lebanon, when Ariel Sharon stood out there, the former uh, Israeli prime minister and uh, war criminal. He said, Yelet pur yelet, dem pur dem, which means a child for a child and blood for blood. Hezbollah used that same line. The Israelis will pay for the blood that they spilled with their own blood. And they retaliated. And over the past 48 hours, we have a total of seven Israeli soldiers killed and about 10 injured in total. And this is very interesting. It's an escalation because the Hezbollah has ramped up its attacks against Israeli military posts in Kiryat Shmona, in uh, basically uh, even all the way to Golan Heights, across the, the Galilee Panhandle, all the way to deep into uh, uh, Israeli uh, occup basically occupied territories. We're talking about. Uh, 15 kilometers beyond the blue line. And th that means one thing, that Hezbollah is telling the Israelis, we are ready for war. Now, of course, Hezbollah is not going to go into a fully-fledged war unless the two, one of the two uh, uh, stipulations that they had set from the beginning. Either Israel changes its behavior towards Lebanon, which means it increases its attacks against Lebanese civilians all the way deep inside Lebanese territories, or the situation in Gaza changes, and we expect if it changes in Rafah, 
that would be the cause for Hezbollah to expand the northern uh, front, which means a major enemy for Israel at the moment, who, which has strategic weapons. We're talking about long-range missiles that can go beyond 500 kilometers. We're talking about possibility of having air defense system. They have attack drones. They have literally just recently, yesterday, confused the, the third Iron Dome in, in north, uh, in the north on the northern front, which uh, is now out of service. So in, you now have Hezbollah deterring three Iron Domes. Each one is, costs about $100 million. So that $300 million of losses for the Israelis, those people are capable, and the Israelis know that, and they're afraid of it, but somebody is pushing them into that war, and that's the Americans who are supporting Benny Gantz, who has aspirations to become the next prime minister. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Uh, the, the, the political talk in the United States right now is putting a lot of blame on Benjamin Netanyahu, so we can kind of see how this is going to shape up, where, it, oh, we just need to, you know, move Netanyahu out. He's gone a bit too far. I can see how the Americans will massage uh, this talking point. And uh, we need somebody more reasonable in there. Benny Gantz is our man, and it just takes one sort of speech by Biden, uh, the Gantz, the Gantz coalition, the Gantz government, or as soon as you start hearing this, then you know that that's all that bad will, all of that sort of, you know, uh, angst, uh, all of the anger will sort of be swept away with Benjamin Netanyahu potentially. Um, so I, I absolutely agree with you on that. That's a, a nice little short term political solution for the U.S. US and Israel to carry on with their business uh, because none of this, as you said, is really going to deter uh, the long-term plan. So what is the long-term plan for Israel? Because, uh, it, you know, pushing Palestinians into Egypt, um, this is absolutely in the interests of uh, the current ruling clique uh, in Tel Aviv. And I think more broadly, most Israelis will probably be happy to see uh, Palestinians pushed into Egypt because then it's not their problem anymore. How realistic is this scenario? I, I hate to paint a, a, a dark picture of the future, but we have to be realistic that there are people in power that are right now mapping out this very scenario and how to manage it how to manage the fallout, et cetera. Uh, Leila, your thoughts on this, this Israeli uh, expansion, uh, what, however you want to call it, solving their, quote, Palestinian problem, which they talk about now quite openly. Uh, but go ahead. Um, it's kind of unrealistic to for the Israelis themselves, and they know that. What uh, I believe is going to happen, and uh, I'm going to quote our dear friend Phoenix on this matter. He always says, that the Palestinians outside of Gaza in Sinai will cause a problem to the Israelis. They will always cause a, a force of retaliation against the Israelis, and that will always be a thorn in their uh, side that they cannot control because they are not in co uh, confined uh, territories. However, if you keep the Palestinians in Gaza in a certain area that's confined and under siege, they can control them and shoot them like fish in a barrel. So realistically, the, is the sane <laughs> Israeli insane generals they do prefer to constrict them to a small area, basically perhaps the south, clear all uh, the north and central Gaza. This is what they think about. But it's really hard uh, to do on the ground because if you have heard what Benny Gantz and other generals had said, that they're going to go back into north Gaza because Hamas has 5,000 uh, um, warriors who came back over there, etc. Which is not true because they never left Gaza in the first place. They're not sitting at the fence. They're still going and sniping and bombarding uh, Gazans in north Gaza. There are about 600,000 plus Palestinians who are stuck in North Gaza, who are now facing starvation. We know of 22 who have died of starvation over the past two weeks, including seven children. And uh, uh, now basically there are 11 children uh, in total. And at the same time, uh, they are facing also uh, diseases because of uh, what you call contaminated water, uh, typhoid, cholera, hepatitis A, all these diseases. So the Israelis prefer to kick them out all the way to the north and clear out uh, step by step, bit by bit, that land and keep it to themselves. This is unfeasible for a reason. The resistance on the ground is still there. They never left. Second thing is that if at any point they're going to try and do exodus, the axis of resistance will move, which will, they will not leave it as is. Third thing, which is the main important thing, is that the Egyptians refuse to host the Palestinians on their own territories in Sinai. And they're building these fortifications to ban any exodus. If you look at the length of the wall and the way that they built it, it looks like a puzzle rather than a city to, to, 
engulf or take in uh, basically millions of people. So the, the, the Egyptians have a strong army. It's a large army. They do have the air defense system. They, the Egyptians, I do believe they will go into war if the Israelis try to force the Palestinians on them. Jordanians, on the other hand, have said it out openly. If you try to push the Palestinians towards Jordan from the West Bank at one point or another, that means war with Jordan as well. So this is interesting. Back to that original talking point that was pushed out that uh, uh, Israel is preparing, constructing some kind of, uh, you know, structures to take Palestinians in uh, when they're pushed out of Gaza. Quite the opposite, in fact. They're, they're, they're doubling up their fortifications f to prevent that outcome and also uh, preparing for a potential military conflict with Israel should that come to pass. Obviously, Egypt's going to want to avoid that possibility at all costs, and I'm sure it's not in the Israeli interest uh, either, um, considering everything that's going on. But the worst part about that, if it did come to any sort of of uh, uh, shooting or back and forth between Israel and Egypt, that the Palestinians are literally caught in the middle. Um, so that makes it all the more complicated, and it'll be very difficult to, you know, avoid uh, casualties uh, either way. Chaos could ensue. So, so if if things become very unstable here. Um, wouldn't that uh, provide an opportunity uh, for Hezbollah, for instance, um, to make more advances uh, in southern Lebanon in order to uh, draw Israeli forces away? Because isn't Israel stretched having to fight a two-front war? Um, they're already very depleted after this operation, which many people will say, while they did flatten northern Gaza for the most part, it wasn't a very big success militarily for the Israelis, but it was a massive success already for for Hamas and for the resistance uh, in Gaza. Uh, your thoughts on, on that? Okay. Uh, what, actually, we're going to go to break right now with TNT, today's news talk, reestablish our connection with the Middle East. I'm Patrick Henningsen, your host. Stick around. We'll be right in a just a few minutes. De-weaponizing weather with reality and perspective. The United States has really been sold a bill of goods. And I've talked about this several times. I've talked about the people that are running this country are literally bullying the United States. And it's hard to believe that the American people actually let them get away with it, except that if you watch, let's say, Jesse Waters' prime time sometimes, and you see the man on the street interviews, you realize these people, and they're all voting, know nothing about what's going on. Or maybe even less than nothing, if that's possible. Now, it's fascinating. We talked about the coal plant issue a couple of days ago. How have carbon emissions changed since 2000. China is up 208%. India is up 158%. Other countries are up 53%. The US is down 10%. Europe is down 16%. Now, here is the question. How is the United States letting these other countries get away with it? And it's kind of simple to understand that the complacency and comfort of the capitalist system and freedom that has developed in the United States is building the road it's riding to its own death. Why? Because they're allowing our leaders to simply do whatever they want to do while other countries get away with it. And you want to know something? I don't have anything against China and India for trying to improve their way of life. But why is it the United States and Europe are committing suicide? This is TNT climate and weather watchdog meteorologist Joe Bastardi asking you to enjoy the weather. It's the only weather you got. Patrick Henningsen talks on today's News Talk Radio, TNT. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. We're still in the first hour of this live broadcast. Thank you for rejoining us. It is Friday, and a big thank you to everybody in our TNT chat community. We see the numbers building up in there. If you want to get involved during the show, just go to tntradio.live or access it through our app, which you can download on Google Play or the Apple Store. You'll see the chat room, the little red bubble. Get involved in there. We've got a thriving community posting a lot of great opposition research going on in our chat community as well as MEMS 
memes, links, and just general banter. We've got a great group of people in there. That's where you want to be during the two hours of this live broadcast, Monday to Friday, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 4 till 6 p.m. UK time. Now, back to uh, the Middle East. I want to welcome back uh, our guest, veteran journalist on the ground in Beirut, Lebanon. Leila Hatoum is joining us right now. And uh, Leila, before the break, uh, I just wanted to get your uh, final thoughts on this. I know you want to open up the conversation uh, to talk about what's happened in Yemen recently, and that's going to bring us into a broader conversation on the axis of resistance as a whole. Uh, but as far as southern Lebanon goes, you mentioned uh, that these Patriot missile batteries that uh, Israel or Iron Dome, uh, their glorified Patriot missile arrays, uh, they're basically protecting a lot of the sensitive military uh, installations that Israel holds and guards so dear. It's not a big territorial area, so it's not like you can hide in the mountains like in other countries. Uh, they're very much exposed, including Israeli air bases as well. Uh, so if things escalate uh, right now, it doesn't Israel have to be extremely careful about how they escalate? Because one move too far could deal a very serious blow to their whole military operation. If, for instance, where their F-35s are housed or F-16s, uh, if any of these are disabled, that would be a serious blow to Israel uh, militarily, and it would prevent them from doing a lot of what they've enjoyed doing uh, over the last four or five months. But uh, your thoughts on on this, the, the Southern Lebanon front and uh, what Hezbollah can do potentially and what risks Israel has. Um, if uh, at any point you were looking at what was happening over the past two weeks, Hezbollah managed to hit Safad. They hit uh, the Northern Command uh, for the Israeli military in uh, uh, basically in Safad as well. They've hit uh, the uh, air radar uh, defense system that they have over there, the Iron Sky for Israel. They've hit critical uh, a, military, a critical military uh, factory that uh, does maintenance for. Uh, the Israeli military uh, equipment and uh, at one point or another armored vehicles. Uh, what you say about the airplanes, it is a possible so, uh, situation, but most of uh, the F-16s and F-35s, they don't fly from the north over Lebanon. They go from Rojdan all the way to Lebanon. That's at least the one that we know of. Um, however, there is no place in Israel that doesn't get, that cannot be not hit by Hezbollah's uh, 500 kilometer plus range missiles. I mean, they can reach beyond Elat, right? Uh, the Israelis learned it the hard way, and that's why at one point or another, they are yet to uh, expand or change their behavior against the Southern Lebanese Front. So no matter what, the army generals in the, on the Northern Front have been fighting with, with their government uh, back inside the Rojdan and uh, in uh, Jerusalem. And the reason is that they understand fully what's at stake, whereas the government is mostly run by radicals uh, who are trying to push for war at one point or another and they don't understand the situation on the ground fully as they do. Netanyahu is not the smart army general, for example, like uh, the ones, basically, Ghadi Eisenkot, who was responsible at one point or another. He's not that smart, but he's smarter than uh, Netanyahu when it comes to uh, uh, fronts and uh, war. The guy has been, uh, he is a veteran general, uh, 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 he's a veteran general. He had launched the war uh, or taken part in the war against uh, Lebanon in 2006. He was behind the Dahi Doctrine, which is the carpet bombing of civilian areas in southern Beirut uh, suburbs. So this guy understands what it means when it's losses on the ground. He lost so many soldiers back in 2006. He understands the capabilities of Hezbollah. That's why he's kind of showing self-restraint over there. However, Ghadi uh, Eisenkot supports Benny Gantz. And Benny Gantz, if he wants to push for an expansion of the northern front, because the Americans are telling him to do so, Radi Eisenkot has no other means but to expand that front. Um, I do understand from our sources on the ground that he had sent several messages back to the um, political command that it would be suicide to go into war against Lebanon at this moment, especially with other fronts open at the same time. Sure. Yeah, this is uh, this is something to consider uh, going forward. So all is not uh, uh, well with the Israeli side when it comes to playing this uh, double game of chess. Uh, so it's something to very much consider. Now, uh, on this on the subject of Yemen, uh, Yemen has fallen off the headlines uh, in recent weeks uh, as the escalation with the U.S. airstrikes 
uh, the U.S. bombing runs, uh, hitting Yemeni targets, hitting also Iraq targets after what happened, uh, uh, allegedly what happened in Jordan. There's arguments about where that happened, that the three uh, U.S. Uh, soldiers uh, killed, uh, what side of the border they're actually on, Syria or Jordan. But let's put that aside. Uh, what is the latest uh, from Yemen, and uh, it has Ansar Allah uh, withstood uh, this various these various waves of salvos uh, from the U.S.'s co coalition? Uh, and what is the latest report there? Yeah, so you do have to understand how the Yemenis operate. They don't go there for show off; they go directly for the kill. And bless their hearts, those people just are so effective to the extent that the Israelis, uh, sorry, the Americans and the British have joined hands together to go and fight them. And until now, they're losing. I mean, the, the Yemenis have downed several US ships and British ships over the past two weeks. They keep going every now and then announcing that they have downed this ship or crippled one another ship. The Americans with all their bombardment and their uh, basically uh, uh, military advancement when it comes to the sky, air, the, um, air forces, they couldn't do anything to stop uh, Ansar al Houthis from firing those uh, missiles or launching these drone attacks against the American and uh, British ships that are uh, trying to, to cross from uh, Bab al-Mandab or uh, Aden, uh, uh, the Gulf of Aden, or basically the Arabian Sea, all the way to the Red Sea. Now, you have to understand one thing. The Yemenis have done this since the beginning of the war until now without shedding a drop of blood. So they have crippled Israeli maritime uh, trade throughout the past five, four months and a half, five months, without shedding a drop of blood. And the reason why they're doing that is to support a ceasefire in Gaza and allow for humanitarian aid to go into Gaza, which actually complies with what the international law says and what the ICG has ruled as well, the International Court of Justice. So at any point, or, or the decision, it's not a ruling until now, um, the Yemenis have been bombarded by the Americans and the British. They recently, today, two hours back, were subject to a vicious attack by the Americans and the British Air Force at one point, and still they haven't been deterred. Now, how they operate, they only come out and announce what they have to say, and then just like, just go back into doing what they do normally. The reason why we don't see them in the headlines, they have fallen off the headlines, is because the mainstream media is playing media blackout, because guess who owns the mainstream media? The Americans, the British, and the pro-Israeli uh, entities. So at any point, they don't want to show that they're losing in Yemen against a lesser, lesser armed uh, group at one point. So that's why you don't see them in the media. We also got a uh, recent uh, couple of days ago, a uh, U.S. drone uh, downed off the coast of Yemen. And, yes, the MQ-9. Uh, the MQ-9. Yes. They, they used a 5000 to $10,000, uh, actually, it's a $5,000 uh, worth missile to down something that's worth $30 million. So uh, go figure. Technological advancement does not mean superiority in, in warfare. No, that that is definitely going to raise uh, eyebrows. It should anyway on the U.S. side. Uh, and the Pentagon is is now being challenged quite seriously on the idea that all of these U.S. strikes have somehow deterred uh, the answer Allah or the Houthis, as they call them in America, uh, the Houthi attacks and uh, defending the shipping lanes uh, in their territorial waters. So like that's becoming a conversation now. Granted, Layla, there's a lot of politics in the United States. They're really pressuring the Biden administration during the election year uh, to kind of put put the blame on them deservedly so obviously they're in charge um but what's interesting Layla, is that this this argument this debate is actually happening now because what will hopefully happen here is a reassessment of the policy itself so that's what we're hoping the fact that they're having this debate uh might lead to a change in policy but all roads lead back to israel uh, on this issue. And that's the important thing to focus on, Layla, because I think a lot of people, they're so focused on the the, the fighting between uh, the the US, uh, UK, uh, and Ansar Allah in Yemen, and they're forgetting the whole reason for Yemen's sanctions and blockade is to uh, call for a ceasefire to stop the killing in Gaza. Um, so yes, this could all be solved uh, with one phone call, uh, but it hasn't. And uh, that's the unfortunate thing. So do you see, uh, in terms of this situation in the Bab al Mandeb Straits in the Red Sea, uh, how do you see this progressing? Um, a lot of people will look at the US naval posture 
and say that actually they really don't have the layers of support necessary for a sustained naval presence in this type of a situation. Uh, other people will say, no, they, ha they have Djibouti, they have the Fifth Fleet uh, in Bahrain, there's plenty of support there. Uh, but is that really true? Because uh, this is a different type of an operation that uh, the United States has never really had to perform in a very difficult area. Uh, what do you see uh, for the future of this uh, standoff right now uh, in, in the Red Sea and with Yemen? You had a full coalition of four countries aided by the Americans since 2015 until recently fighting against Asarullah Houthis in Yemen. And with all their technological advancement, Air Force, the money that was poured in, the Navy and everything else that was brought in against the Ansarullah Houthis, and yet they couldn't deter them. Every five minutes we hear the Americans coming out and say like, oh, we're going to hit them, we will deter them. And every single time the Americans hit the Yemenis, the Yemenis retaliate by downing uh, a $30 million MQ-9 or downing a ship or crippling a British ship. So basically, you cannot deter people who live in their own land and know their land and their waters very well, and they have nothing to lose. The most dangerous people are those who don't, who basically have nothing to lose. There's something else that actually supports them, and this is what Sayyid uh, Malik Houthi, uh, Abdul Malik Houthi said uh, recently, I think it was yesterday or today, he said, we do believe in God, and we have faith that God is supporting us. So when you have a really strong faith, and you have nothing to lose, that gives you more power to actually go and defend what you're doing and you believe in what you're doing and um, one other thing you have to understand the pentagon is talking about it it's not because they're reassessing their military strength or anything else it's because they're reassessing their military contracts arms cartels and the pentagon are responsible for arms sales across the world as well the us is the largest arms dealer in the world and at any point if you down if you can down an mq9 30 million dollars worth mq9 with a five thousand dollar missile most of those who want to buy a defense system will buy the $5,000 missile rather than the Iron Dome or anything else. So it's, it all filters down to money. And you have to understand, numbers are something that uh, they have kind of, a, I have a soft spot for them because I was a macroeconomist. And if you look at it, with, combine the money with the military factor, you just see basically it's based on contracts, nothing else. Sure. You're, and that, that, that's a sizable portion of the United States is increasingly bloated $1.2 trillion annual defense, mm -hmm. but that's the real figure, $1.2 uh, trillion. A lot of those uh, projects, those those initiatives, uh, they've been going for decades. Uh, some of them never actually make it to the battlefield, but they still get funding uh, for research and they still keep the projects going. That's the system we have in America. It's a very unefficient and expensive system but it's uh, you know keeps a lot of people uh happy and making lots of money and i think that's probably a big driver of it um but just on on the issue of of yemen so they've really uh you know from from a global position a lot of people are looking at uh answer allah in yemen and saying well yep they're very capable and so you know in terms of the conversation about the axis of resistance um the axis of resistance as a result of the last you know five months um is arguably much stronger uh arguably much more formidable arguably much more highly regarded globally I'm not talking about in the middle east i'm talking about what the chinese are thinking what some of these other countries are thinking when they're looking at this brazil they're they're thinking are they thinking to themselves leila well it looks like there's actors in the middle east that can take care of business themselves uh and they're not requiring external assistance to do that to manage their own affairs how is this conversation shifting about the axis of resistance and the Middle East right now, globally? Well, um, I do speak to Russian and Chinese sources most of the time, and you have to understand what they have kept saying since the beginning, that because the axis of resistance for the first time is unified, and there's a central communications happening between them, a division between what part each side has to play and when, this is what gave them the superiority. They know the land, they are part of this uh, whole region, and they know what they want, and they've put their demands from day one. Whereas when it comes to the allies of Israel, each one comes from a different side, different interests, different political and financial interests also come to play at one point or another. Some of them are not convinced into going into war. Most of them have financial and economic problems back home. So at any point, they are not unified when it comes to uh, what's happening in the region. However, they all agree that Israel, in one form or another, has to stay over there to keep their interests. 
So uh, the scale of fighting, not everybody goes wholeheartedly. Not everybody believes in this fight, and that's what causes divisions. There's not a centralized command uh, command ship that can command, for example, the British and the Americans at the same time. The Americans want to do something, the British want to do something else. Sometimes they do it together, sometimes they don't. So that actually divides them. Uh, basically, this is uh, how they're losing, and this is how the Chinese and the Russians are looking at it. But you ha also have to understand, the Chinese are not there to support the Axis resistance of, or anybody else. They do what they have been doing for the longest time. They care for economic expansion. That's why they have a company that's running the port of Haifa, which is owned by the Indians, by the way. And at the same time, they always send their own um, uh, people. I mean, like they don't have to be under the government directly, but they sell weapons for both warring sides, no matter what. The Russians, on the other hand, they always stick to their allies. They've never shifted from sticking to their allies. And they are looking at what's happening over here with admiration. I mean, one of the Russian diplomats I spoke with said, it's very admirable that they managed to stand their ground for the longest time, especially people in Gaza. Nobody expected them to, to last this long, Hamas and the PIJ. No, no, that's that's definitely, I think, uh, going his, to be... His exact word, I'm sorry to, yeah, I'm sorry to cut you off. Yeah, go his ahead. exact word was, they showed the Americans as clowns. Yeah, and, and also it's uh, the, the the Israeli uh, supporters. They're they're public. Um, they were told that this was going to be done and dusted in like two weeks or something like that, um, and that they're going to eliminate Hamas. And they haven't. How close have they come to quote eliminating Hamas after five months? It's always two weeks what? with them. It's always two weeks with them. Two weeks have gone into five months. The Americans remember when they wanted to launch the war on Yemen with their allies in the GCC. They said it's going to take two weeks to two months. For Assad, he's not going to stay for more than two months. It's always number two for them. Yeah, so when you see two weeks, uh, then you get to get, get ready to readjust your, your calendar uh, pretty quickly. So this, this is very interesting. All these developments are pointing to a very interesting uh, couple of months coming. Obviously, you know, we want, we would like to see a cessation of hostilities for the people uh, in Gaza for the Palestinians first and foremost, um, but we also have to uh, also hedge our analysis to uh, look at what could happen uh, should that not be the case. Um, so I think it's very important to look at both tracks. I'm not a, I'm not a black pill or a white pill guy. I'm sort of right in the middle, Layla. So I'm looking at all outcomes, hoping for the best. Obviously, this is one of the worst humanitarian disasters uh, that we've had to witness and bear witness to. Uh, the world has bear witness to in the last uh, four to five months. Um, so yeah, we really appreciate you joining us on TNT and your analysis on these very, very important issues. Layla Itum, veteran journalist based in Beirut, Lebanon. Thank you for coming on the program this week, Layla. Thank you, Patrick. There she goes, ladies and gentlemen. Well, top of the hour news headlines are coming up. Uh, we've got a lot more on the other side. We've got Basil Valentine. We've got Matthew Russell Lee, Inner City Press, the Julian Assange case in the federal court in the U.S. That will have direct bearing on the extradition case in London. We'll find out all about that and more all coming up in the next hour. Stick around. We'll see you in a few.